Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 13. Hopefully you had a great midterm week. So we're coming back, I think in almost two weeks. So let's start with the um, announcements and also a few recaps. Probably you forgot a lot of um, things we discussed two weeks ago. So, yep. So the first of all announcements, and then we'll be recapping a few things that we did on two weeks from today ago, two like two weeks ago. Yeah, we did uh, semantic parsing. So and also we didn't cover a few topics in semantic parsing, which are strong supervision versus weak supervision. And I forgot to write this down, but we'll be going into paper analysis. And then I'll briefly discuss what we're gonna be doing on Wednesday with your TAs. So first of all, announcements. So I, I, uh, hopefully you already saw this no seven no penalty late days on KLMS. So I'll describe a bit more about this is and how this works. So, so uh, you can think of this as uh, you don't get penalized for submitting the assignment for seven days and you do not have to specify which which for us which assignment you're going to use late days because anyways we'll be we'll penalizing the late days all together at the end but also probably you remember that i will not accept assignment that has been submitted after seven days so for those assignments that has been submitted after the uh, seven days um after the uh, due date i mean seven days after the due date you will basically get zero for that. But otherwise, this penalty late days will be applied. And of course, at the end, you will sum every late days and you will get seven days without any penalty. So, so I'll probably give an example to better describe this. So suppose that in was assignment one, you submitted uh, one late day. I mean, you submit the assignments one day after the deadline. And suppose that assignment two, you submit this on six days after deadline. And suppose that assignment three, you submitted eight days after deadline. And assignment four, suppose you submitted two days after the deadline. Then we first see that assignment three will get zero points because you submit the seven days after the seven days of the deadline. So this just is zero. And you basically add all the late days that are not more than seven days late, then it becomes negative one minus six minus two, which is just nine, right? But then I'm giving you seven no penalty late days. So you will add seven to this. So your late days at the end will be just negative two. And this is basically how much you get deducted from the each assignment. So this will be negative twenty percent per the uh, per one assignment. So at the end, and one assignment only cost fifteen percent of the entire grade. So this will be then deducted with um, how much is it? Zero point, not zero point, actually just negative 3% of your final grade. So hopefully this, the math uh, makes sense to you. Let me know if you have any question. Oh, of course, uh, assignment three in this case will be 0%. So um, you will have another 15% minus. So it will be minus 18% at the end if you have submitted the assignments with this schedule.
Um, so it's a bit tricky because the final project is very has a very hard deadline. I, I'll try to give you as as many. I'll say I'm as I'll I'll try to make the deadline as late as possible because um, I don't want you to be too pressured on it. But then there is a hard deadline to. Um, for the submitting the your grades to the school, so it's really hard to give you um, no penalty days for the final project. So the final project has no really late days because it has to be really the final. Yeah, we have, we have the, the school has deadlines too, right? So those deadlines cannot be really um, compromised, but I'll try to give you as many, um, I mean, I, I'll try to make the deadline as late as possible. By the way, we uh, if you looked into the schedule, we will have the days, uh, we will commit the uh, two days in the final exam um, week on the, the, uh, your presentation of the final project. So that will be your really hard deadline for submitting a report because of course um, you will be able, you will need to be ready for your presentation on those days. Any other question? All right, so let's move to um, assignment two. So I know that um, some of you raised or asked what's the expected accuracy. Many of you are saying that you're not getting good accuracy, uh, especially compared to the classification task, because in classification, I think I told you that you need to be getting at least somewhere near 80%. But um, question answering is more difficult task than classification task. So it's not expected that you will get close to that, but still many of you are saying it's not really getting good scores. And actually that's because I think uh, the instructions in the assignment one, assignment one, assignment two was were not comprehensive enough. And I think it's not, your fault that you were having troubles there. Although there are some people who were able to get good scores too, but um, I'm saying um, it was not, I think, clear enough. So I'll try to not give you too much, um, I would say penalty on the assignment too, even if you're not getting good scores, very minimal penalties, I would say. So it will be more on the um, grading, will be more on the what, how you implemented the model. And if it's in the right direction, especially compared to how you would do classification, the sentence classification, because the whole purpose of assignment two was how you can implement a token classification compared to text or the sequence classification. So they'll, that will be the focus of the grading and don't worry too much about the uh, score. So that I wanted to say that, especially because um, some people actually raised the concern on GitHub discussions. So next is uh, assignment three. It will be released today. And it's not coding assignments. It's about writing a two page, two page dummy paper with fake experiments, et cetera. So, You'll learn soon what that means um, on today's lecture, and also it will be more clear in the um, assignment description. It will be released today. And number four is that it's important thing. You will be required to attend next class to get the full participation credit, which is 10% of your grade. And you will get some portion of it just by attending next class. And uh, some of the portion will be dedicated towards how active you are in the uh, discussions. So 
I'll give you more details at the end of today's lecture as well. And after, so today will be about semantic parsing and paper analysis. On Wednesday, we'll be doing the discussions. And finally, next Monday, we'll begin with the pre-trained language models in which we're moving towards more modern NLP techniques. So hopefully you're excited about this because it means that we are more than halfway in this semester. All right, so let's go, let's start with the recap on semantic parsing. So it's been two weeks. So hopefully um, you'll be able to remember many of things that we discussed through this recap. So this was after, if you recall, syntactic parsing, right? So you remember the syntactic parsing, which is really about obtaining a syntactic tree, like verb phrase, VP, MP, etc. But semantic parsing is a bit different problem because the purpose of semantic parsing is mapping natural language uh, to a logical form that can be understood by the target database or the computer, basically. And of course, target logic space can vary depending on what the application is, such as SQL query. In this case, then you have a question and you map this question, natural language question to a SQL query so that your answer, the answer to your question can be obtained from the database by simply querying on the database. There are more complex logic spaces like first order logic, lambda calculus, or even like typical programming language. I think we saw this in the uh, GPT-3 example in the first class, right? And also knowledge graph. And really the important thing is that the output parts should be executable by the computer. So one popular example, I'm actually going, before going into the example, so what was the difference between syntax and semantics or syntactic parsing and semantic parsing? I mentioned that we, uh, I mentioned that syntax is the grammar of the sentence, whereas semantics is the meaning of the sentence. And you also might often hear the word pragmatics when you read papers in NLP, and it means the context of the sentence. And you can think of the dialogue. So, Syntax can be often rigorously defined. Of course, there are some ambiguous cases, but still relatively very rigorous and very well defined. But it's almost impossible to fully define the semantics and of course, pragmatics of natural language because there are countless entities, countless relations and relations might not be just first order. They, they might be second order, third order can be very complex. So we have to make uh, assumptions about the, um, the scope of the semantics that we talk about. But really the benefit of semantic parsing is that it's directly applicable to many real world tasks. So what's the one popular example, knowledge graph QA. So if we want to ask a question, when was KAIST founded? We can approach this problem as a machine reading comprehension, which was your assignment too, right? And if we are able to find a good document that contains the answer, that we might be able to get the answer from the document as a span, right? But more popular or more preferred approach in general for this kind of factual questions is framing the problem as a semantic parsing problem where you try to map the question to a logical form, KAIST slash founded. So this task will be mapping this question to this form, KAIST founded. And once you have mapped the question to KAIST slash founded, which is a logical form, then you can execute this on the database so that you can obtain the answer in a very efficient and 
deter deterministic manner. And that's exactly the benefit of semantic parsing compared to the um, more of a machine reading comprehension question answering, because it's more inter interpretable, efficient, and also very, I would say, rig rigorous. And another example is natural language to SQL. So there are several data sets that have been proposed in recent five years. So one of the first large data sets on this domain was WikiSQL that has about 80,000 questions. And these were crowdsourced. So they were relatively easy to obtain because you're using um, non-experts, but these non-experts don't really know about SQL. So one of the critical strategies that the paper discusses is how we can utilize these non-experts to annotate relatively difficult annotations like SQLs, SQL queries. And there are two data sets that have appeared in the next two years, which are Spider and Spark CoSQL. So these are both from Yale University. And the, the characteristics of these two data sets is that rather than using the non-experts, which are cheap, but do not have any knowledge on the SQL, they use the, the um, PhD students who are probably experts, right? They know what SQL is and annotated relatively less number of questions, but still very large if you're um, considering that this was not from the crowdsourcing, but from the experts. And they have a uh, diverse domains, 138 different domains. And once, you, once, once they have obtained this data set, they extended this to two context aware SQL data sets, which are Spark and CoSQL. So Spark is multi-turn and CoSQL is more of a conversational semantic parsing. The image here is actually from WikiSQL. So you can see what it means to really map a question to a SQL query. Your question was how many CFL teams are from your college and your target SQL query will be select count CFL team from CFL draft where college equal York. And of course, this SQL query can be executed on this table and the answer can be trivially obtained by the execution. So how do we approach this problem? And we discussed in the last lecture that one of the, the most straightforward ways and also most popular ways, I think at the moment is providing strong supervision. Here, the training data contains the target logical form query. So this is actually default for many modern semantic parsing tasks compared to actually more, I would say older data sets like Atis and GeoQuery. These are actually often approached as not strong supervision. They don't have logical forms in the data sets sometimes. Actually, Addis has it, but um, I think GeoQuery was, I'm not actually sure, maybe both of them contain it, but they were often approached as a, a weak supervision. But anyways, I'll just erase this because I think it might confuse some of you. So the, the, the advantage of this supervision or this kind of data set is that you're being trained on what you're being evaluated on. So it's straightforward. And what that means is you can use sick to sick such as transformer to train the model. It's quite simple formulation, right? Your input is natural language query and your output is SQL query which is uh, also a sequence. So you can use sick to sick to train a model, just like how you would do on the machine translation. But there is a very big disadvantage of this approach is that unlike machine translation, especially, most crowd workers don't know what the logical form or the um, how the SQL works. So if you ask these 
non-experts, it'd be very difficult or impossible to expect that they will be able to get correct annotations of the given queries. So it means that it's either quite expensive because you will have to use experts, just like Yale PhD students, or you have to use a smart trick, which WikiSQL did, but there's also some limitations. You can, uh, we can maybe discuss later when we have time, but for now, you can think of it as there is no free lunch. And so in many cases, you have to consider a case where you will not be provided with the, the exact logical form that corresponds to the given natural language query. So how can we approach this problem? And the, the answer is that we might want to try a weak supervision method. So let's consider NL2 SQL as an example. In this strong supervision case, we are assuming that you were given the target SQL. So you can approach the problem as sick to sick. But how about it, instead of giving the target SQL query, just giving the answer to the model. So the final answer to the answer to the model will be uh, in the wiki SQL case, just this. So you're given just these two and you're saying that in this weak supervision, this SQL query is not given. It has a really good advantage that this can be answered by the non-experts too, right? Because you can ask someone who doesn't know SQL this question, how many CFL teams are from your college? And just, you can look at the database and you know that there are two because the CFL teams, um, where is it? From your college is um, here, this one. this one and this one, right? So, so you know that there are two people, right? So then non-experts will be able to also give out the answer, even if they don't know what SQL is. Looks great, right? So there are certainly advantages. It's easier to collect data. So it's cheaper and easier to scale up in terms of the number. But the, there's one really big disadvantage, one really big con, which is how can you do this? Can you formulate this problem as sick to sick too? Which doesn't make sense in many cases because the question always depends, the answer to the question depends on the database. So it doesn't make sense to formulate this problem as a simply question to result. Right, it has to depend on the SQL, on the, on the given database. So there are several methods. Um, I think in the modern age, there are more, more um, other methods too, but I'll try to discuss uh, really the major ones. So approach one is distance supervision. So what does this mean? It's actually quite simple. The naming is a bit maybe not too, not too intuitive, but the approach means that the dis, uh, distance provision means that you basically generate several candidates and you find out which arrive at the answers. So if you're able to generate a good number of candidates, that's not too large, but still large enough to contain a one candidate that arrives at this, the answer, then you can basically use these candidates as the positive examples and the rest as the negative examples and try to do whatever you want. Uh, you can try to formulate this as a sick to sick problem, just like strong supervision, because you're considering these candidates that arrive at the answers as the positive, I mean, as the, the ground truth, although they might not be of course, right? This has several advantages in that, of course, you can, you don't have to worry too much about your model. What you have to worry more about is how you can have a good rule to generate these candidates. 
But in many cases, you might not be able to generate a small enough number of candidates. This will not be working too well if you're not able to arrive at the answer with your generated candidates because you will not have any possible example. Or if you have too many candidates, then maybe it also means, um, well, actually, if you have too many candidates, then it also means that you have too many negative examples. So you might have to sample some of them. So distance revision is a popular approach, but um, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. And, um, and also, but still it's, I think it's very promising approach in many cases, but it really depends. It has a high dependency on how you generate the candidate. And this is also oftentimes through often through rules. So you define some rules given your knowledge about the target database or target logic space. It has a lot of inductive bias. Okay. And approach two is you can try to parse as a latent, you can try to consider the parse as a latent variable. So it's a bit more mathematical approach in that you're considering, you're formulating, formulating this problem as a probabilistic model. And suppose that your target parse is y, this is target parse. So SQL, SQL query basically in WikiSQL or the NL to SQL example. So this is a SQL and this is the um, query, input query, natural language query, right? So what you're trying to formulate or what you're trying to compute is this probability distribution, right? And how do you compute this? Well, as I said, if you try to compute this directly, or if you try to model this directly, it doesn't really make sense because Y is an answer and it doesn't directly depend on the natural language query. It actually has an intermediate form, which is a parse P that leads to the answer by executing on the database. So that's why you formulate you, this, uh, you basically formulate this as a summation of this, pro this probable distribution, which is now con also you're trying to um, include the parse P into the, the probability. So hopefully you all agree with this uh, first equality because you're marginalizing, you're, you're basically, formulating P of Y given X as the marginalization of P of Y and P given X. So everyone agrees with that, hopefully. So it's a simple math. And then you formulate this as you basically translate this into the multiplication of these two probability distributions, P of Y given P and X and P of P given X. And it's a simple bias rule that if you multiply these two, then it's P of Y, P given X, right? So that's why it's equivalent. So looking into this equation more closely, really the important things again is how we can generate the candidate parses, right? So it actually doesn't really, um, 
it, it's not too much different from the, the distance provision. The, the, the core, core difference is that in distance provision, you're trying to create the data set in a more of a very synthetic or in a pseudo way. But in approach two, instead of making in a making creating a data set in a pseudo way, which might not be mathematically rigorous, you are instead for um, you're instead injecting that that pseudoness of distance provision into your probability distribution so that mathematically you are very rigorous about how you approach this problem. So you get, hopefully you understand what the relationship between approach one and two. So two is good in that this is very mathematically um, exact. But you have the same problem though, because if you have, there are too many possible candidates, the marginalizing the probability is in, intractable. So suppose that the number of possible candidates is like millions. Then what that means is then you have to actually consider the probably distribution for all these millions of um, candidates, which is very slow. So that's why what we do in practice is that we need to sample P. And when we are sampling P, it's actually, once we have trained the model, it's quite straightforward because, um, so I'll actually write this down the next page. So what was the equation? So again, P of Y given X is summation of P of Y given P and X. This is big P by the way. Um, there are two different P's. Hopefully you don't get confused. This is a probability. This piece, the small piece parse. P of uh, P, small p given x, right? And small p. Um, and you know that because this is basically, what, what is this equivalent to? This is basically the expectation over P. Actually, I'll write. Of P of Y given P, P given P and X, right? Because that's the definition of uh, expectation of certain value. Hopefully remember that recall any some, this is equivalent to expectation of certain um, function over A is equivalent to summation of F A times P of A over all A, right? So everyone knows this, I hope so. So this is just recall. So then now what you can think of this is then because this is expectation, when you're doing during your inference, you can sample P and then you basically just um, sum those values by just you sample P and then you can just use these values. I'm saying that sample P, so you have a, some, a lot of candidates and then you sample P and then you compute the probability for these P and then just compute the um, summation on those values. That's exactly what the expectation is enabling you to do, right? So during inference time, it's easy to approximate this expectation without any bias, right? This is just basically um, not equality, but what I'm saying is this is approximately equal to without any bias, you sample P from, so you sample P um, and then you just basically do the um, summation, right? Uh, so probably it's not the best way to write. So, just a second. 
So what I was trying, what I was trying to say is, you sample p yep so basically you sample p and just basically um just consider your samples as your entire distribution and then you will not have any bias so um, that's the really the good thing about um this formulation because you're making this as an um, expectation of this p of y given p of p and x. But there's one problem with this, which is that, okay, it's great. It's great that this inference can be approximated without any bias. But can you say that, can you approximate the gradients too what, during training? And it turns out that you cannot just, um, approximate in the same way. So I'll not go into details today because um, probably hopefully you'll be able to get to this in, in the reinforcement learning class or maybe uh, advanced deep learning class. But the point is that what I wanted to say is that during inference time, it's straightforward to actually compute the P of Y given P and X. But in the training time, when you're trying to compute the gradients of P, because that's what you're really trying to obtain, right? then in that case, then um, you actually have to do some math. And that's exactly what Reinforce is doing. Um, in a nutshell, what Reinforce does for you is it enables you to approximate the gradient in an unbiased way. We just saw how we can do this for the inference in an unbiased way, which is straightforward. For, com for computing gradients, it's not straightforward. You have to do some tricks and that what, that's what Reinforce does for you. So that's how you compute gradients without any bias. And that's called also policy gradient. And also that's really popular um, mechanism in reinforcement learning. But this has no bias, but high variance. And what does high variance means in general? It's really hard to train because it has so much I would say fluctuation that it's really hard to get to good optimization destination. So in, in practice, actually, I think I mentioned this a few more times in previous lectures. No bias is very important thing in theory, but in practice, actually many people prefer biased estimation. And I think I mentioned that one example was sick to sick teacher forcing, right? Teacher forcing is actually biased. It's not unbiased estimation, but because it has lower variance than the uh, unbiased the high variance estimation, it actually leads to pretty good, um, I would say optima than the um, unbiased but high variance estimation. So you can, I, and I think I mentioned that in previous lectures that if you want to do stick to stick, it, in no, no bias way, then something like policy gradient is required. But in practice, no one really uses it unless they're kind of fine tuning at the end. In some papers, they try to do this. They try to fine tune at the end after biased, uh, several, a lot of iterations with biased um, loss. And then they basically, at the end, they try to fine tune with uh, unbiased high variance, um, basically estimation. Um, and um, there are several reinforcement learning techniques. Such as actor critic, and these are actually biased estimations too. So you will see that, okay, these are biased, but they have no, I mean, they have slow, lower variance that in practice, they lead to better optima again. So it's, it, the concept is quite important that what's the difference between bias and variance and why you need um, relatively low bias, but also in many cases, having some bias is not a problem relative to having super high variance. Okay. So we basically cover a few more tasks, right? Um, uh, syntactic here and semantic. 
And we saw that uh, how we formulate these tasks, uh, how we approach these problems is sometimes quite similar to how we did with other tasks. Semantic parsing is quite similar to text generation when if you're using sick to sick. If you're using the um, latent variable techniques, then for the weak supervision, it's a bit different, but still you're dealing with some sick to sick component in the model. Syntactic parsing, I think it's a bit different from all these three. If you're talking about the, the traditional constituency parsing, but modern work methods such as um, transition-based dependence parsing is also quite similar to sick to sick or text generation. So I, I mentioned that up to this is kind of half of the class and the rest of the class will be covering these two, pre-training, fine-tuning, and probably will be mostly focusing on the pre-training and fine-tuning and a bit on the in-context learning because this is really super new that it's not really, um, we, did not, we, do, we do not understand this very well at the moment. It's very recent but at least it's good to know what's happening in the literature for many of you. So for the rest of the class, I'll be going through a few papers and we'll be really talking about how we can um, interpret and also write a scientific paper. And there's actually a class in KAIST, how to write a scientific paper. I think many of you have already taken it or are taking it right now, and I highly recommend it. But um, I'm dedicating today's a little, uh, portion of today's class and also next class and also an assignment on this too, because number one, it is very important if you want to write a paper. And number two, even if you have taken or are taking this scientific paper class, NLP and ML papers have slightly different tastes than, for instance, biology, physics papers. So I think it's a bit, um, it's worth it to really dedicate one or two classes because being knowledgeable of these and leveraging these knowledge will enable you to write a paper much more effectively and efficiently. And I always say this, it's like a small investment now it might be a bit boring, but that will save your time a lot during your course of study. And of course, if you're going into, you're staying in the academia or research, then it will be very useful for the rest of your career too, right? So we'll, we're gonna have a, a short break until 3.20 and we'll devote the rest 30 minutes on the analysis and it will be important for you because you'll use these techniques in your discussion next lecture on Wednesday. So see you in um, three minutes at 3.20.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Okay, so let's go into the um, paper analysis. So I'll first give you a, 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 a very rough breakdowns of um, what kind of papers there are. Of course, these are subjective and not comprehensive, but um, in my experience, you can fit in most papers fit most papers into one of these categories. So let me first briefly describe this. And I think you will also, you're encouraged to use this breakdown in your discussion on Wednesday and try to see um, if any paper, if the paper fits into one of these categories or maybe then maybe it doesn't fit into one of them that you can um, try to um, propose a new category or subcategory. So I usually think of a paper in a largely three, one of three categories, task, method, or analysis. So what is task paper or data set paper? So they propose a new task and or data set. So in the, um, in the first case, 1A, it could propose an entirely new task. So for instance, um, I would say someone probably proposed uh, every task for the first time in some on some day, right? So for instance, machine translation was formally proposed uh, many years ago, like 1960s, 50s, but relatively maybe recent tasks are for instance, I would say um, like facts verification. Of course, um, this is more recent because it's a bit more complicated than or maybe more, it has more components, I think, than other tasks. So the paper could be proposing an entirely new task. Or B, 1B, the paper could be proposing a new data set for an existing task. So for many papers, many data set papers fall into this subcategory. For instance, question answering has existed for many years, but you can propose a new data set on question answering and that could be 1B. And I want to also mention that it cannot be always clearly distinguished even between 1A and 1B because a data set can, uh, some data set, if they're sufficiently different from other data sets in the task, same task, then maybe you can consider that data set as a new task. So it's not always clear if the proposed data set can be, should be considered as a new task or uh, existing task. But I think it's, it's more of subjective and it's not super um, discrete line between them. It's more of a gray area, but it's bit easier to understand what this means through examples than I think trying to describe everything in, on this slide. And also one C is, you're sometimes proposing a new evaluation metric for an existing data set and task. So for question answering or machine reading comprehension, for instance, most popular evaluation metric is F1 and exact match, but you might want to propose a new evaluation metric because existing evaluation metrics are not good enough. And of course you will have to persuade readers why that's your evaluation metric is also much better. And also the difference is significant enough for the publication. And number two, method paper. So in this case, you're proposing a new method for a target task. You're in, what that means is you're either achieving the best performance in one or more evaluation metrics some things like accuracy, speed, memory complexity, etc., without altering the task. So your task is the same. So you can exactly compare with previous papers on these tasks. You basically just achieve better numbers than them. So 2A, I think is most, uh, one of the most straightforward way to write a paper because um, I'm not saying it's like the only way or the best way to write a paper, but it's quite straightforward because 
at least everyone agrees what this means, why this is important. If they agree that task is significant enough, because if task is significant enough, then getting the best number in the task is definitely then uh, meaningful, right? And two B is you're imposing an additional restriction on the task and show the best performance. For instance, in zero shot or few shot, you're saying that you don't have many training examples, even though data set was not originally meant to meant for that. So maybe you're considering uh, squad as your data set, but instead of considering all those 80,000 training examples, maybe you want to show that if even with just training on the uh, 1,000 examples in the, in the data, you can achieve very good performance compared to other methods that only used 1,000 examples. And of course, your performance might not be better than or comparable to the models that used entire data set. So you cannot really say that it has achieved the best performance without altering the task. But instead, you altered some, um, some aspects in the task so that you can have a new perspective on the task. Zero shot is one case. Continual learning is another case that in this case, you're considering um, in a, uh, you're learning one task at a time on the same model. And you're saying that when you're learning a second task, in many cases, you forget what your first task, um, you forget about the first task. So in this case, you are evaluating on the first task after training on the second task and you want to get better number than um, the vanilla way. And of course, again here, um, your number will not be as good as just training the model on the first task, but um, you have imposed this setup, which is first of course has to be, um, has to be proven to the readers or it has to persuade the reader first why that's, that, that imposing the restriction is meaningful or it's realistic which means it, does it happen in the real life scenarios? And, and if that's the case, then it, it makes sense that you actually impose this restriction. And to see is you're proposing a new paradigm for approaching an existing problem. And in this case, you might not be imposing an additional restriction and you might not be achieving the best performance, but how you approach the problem is quite different and also seems promising enough that you persuade the readers that this is a, a new paradigm that the future work will be um, will be at some, on some day uh, using this paradigm. And maybe now it's not as good as other works, but it has a good benefits that uh, it's worth mentioning. So these are usually, if they actually succeed, then really big papers. For instance, early neural network papers are kind of this, fall into this category. Um, they were not actually maybe showing better performance than, um, you know, SVMs in the early days, but still they were trying to propose uh, a new paradigm. And they were saying this might actually at some point really, um, you know, change the field. Um, three is analysis paper. In this category, you're analyzing, you analyze existing tasks or methods. So what kind of analysis do you wanna do? Maybe you want to refute a popularly held belief about a task or method, theoretically or experimentally. 3B is you verify an experimentally proven belief with theories or vice versa. Or 3C is that you reveal some interesting characteristics about a task or method. And I want to mention that papers don't always fall into one category or subcategories. They oftentimes actually fall into several different categories and subcategories. So um, don't think of it as a super exclusive thing. And we'll see this soon, how this works. And what's the role of each? Um, and then um, I'll, when we're trying to analyze paper in more depth, we'll try to 
classify the role of each sentence in abstract and intro. So I think they can be largely broken down into a few um, roles. These are not comprehensive again. They might, there might be more, but I think these are really often observed. And it's important to really um, be aware of these because when you're writing a paper, you probably want to utilize most of these to make your paper very um, persuasive. So a sentence might be a background where you're giving a smooth introductory sentence before diving into the problem or your point. It might be a motivation where you're trying to motivate the readers what's problematic. It might be a proposal that describes what's being proposed in the paper. It might be a comparison to a previous work or many previous works. And here you're making a direct comparison very rigorously. You're making a maybe evaluation. Um, you're actually talking about how, the how your method is being evaluated or you might be talking about some experimental results that uh, your paper contains. And you might be also talking about the implications of these results. And they basically signify what they mean in general and in a grand scheme of things. And lastly, but of course not really lastly, there might be more, uh, more of a related work that describes other works that are more loosely related than um, comparisons, I would say. So let's try to use these two tools, right? One is classifying each paper into one of these categories. And number two is classifying each sentence in the abstract into one of these categories for the following papers. And this will be exactly what you're going to be doing yourself with other students on Wednesday. So uh, please pay attention. So here are the, there are uh, three papers that you should be already familiar. Um, this one, this one, and this one, these were in your reading list. And these are new ones that I haven't discussed before, but you will also be very familiar with these because they are talking about question answering too. Um, so let's take a look then. So the first paper that we're gonna look into is uh, Trial 2014. This is the first sick to sick paper that we discussed in the uh, machine translation. And this can be considered as method paper, why? Because um, it's not task paper because it doesn't propose a new data set. It actually utilizes existing machine translation data set called WMT. It's not really an analysis paper, I think, because it's not really trying to um, you know, analyze an existing model. It's more of a method paper. And which category does this fall into then? Um, so first of all, I'll go into this paper in case you don't remember this paper. Um, so this paper was about um, the, this thing, right? Hopefully you remember. This is the original sick to sick paper with encoder and decoder. And let's try to read the abstract first to actually try to categorize this paper into one of those paper categories. And we can also, of course, try to categorize paper, categorize each sentence too, but let's first read the paper. It says, in this paper, we propose a novel neural network model called RNN encoder decoder that consists of two recurrent neural networks. One RNN encodes a sequence of symbols into a fixed length vector representation, and the other decodes the representation into another sequence of symbols. The encoder and decoder of the proposed model are jointly trained to maximize the conditional probability of a target sequence given a source sequence. The performance of a statistical machine translation system is empirically found to improve by using the conditional probabilities of phrase pairs computed by the RNN encoder decoder as an additional feature in the existing log linear model. Qualitatively, we show that the proposed model learns a semantically and syntactically meaningful representation of linguistic phrases. 
So it's an actually interesting paper because this paper is not really was not really focused on getting the uh, doing getting the state of the art performance in the WMT because it was not able to actually back then. So if you look into the results here, they do not really compare against um, the SMT, which is statistical machine translation. They only compare against um, more of a I would say RNNs and other neural network based papers. And also um, some, I would say relatively easy, uh, I mean, relatively, I would say uh, low performance SMT papers, right? So we cannot, so let's go back to the, uh, the categories. So we cannot probably say that this falls into, um, so we know that this is a method paper and we cannot probably say it achieved the best performance. We can say kind of it's falling to B and C because it's kind of imposing an additional restriction that you're mainly comparing against neural network paper, right? Neural, neural network models, but also it's kind of proposing a new paradigm in a sense that it doesn't contain any rule-based uh, components. It's entirely data-driven. It's fully neural network based. So if readers actually are persuaded that neural networks are really, um, I would say very um, promising in the future, then they can be persuaded that also this paper has really meaningful contribution because it will be opening a new, um, new door to the uh, neural network based approaches for neural machine translation, uh, machine translations, right? So uh, personally, I think, and people might have different opinions. I think this falls into B and C. They kind of impose a restriction and also it's kind of proposing a new paradigm for machine translation. And let's try to now um, classify each sentence into uh, its role. I'll, I'll just go through the abstract because we don't have much time. Um, so how about the first sentence? In this paper, we propose noble neural network. So clearly this is about the proposal, right? They're talking about what they're, 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 they are talking about what they're proposing. And this is also um, about their proposal describing their method in more details. One RNN encoder encodes a sequence of symbols. And then they also describe in the second sentence, third sentence, their proposal too, right? And now we go into the, the performance of a statistical machine translation system uh, is, imp is found to improve by using the conditional probabilities of phrase pairs computed by the RNN encoder decoder as an additional feature. So this is exactly what the paper is actually um, really um, arguing, right? So that it's, it's, I mean, it's basically the empirical experimental results, what the paper is saying. And also it again has a sentence that, that shows, uh, that describes about the experimental results too. Qualitatively, we show that the proposed model learns a semantically and syntactically meaningful representations. This can be considered as I think, uh, empirical results, but also implications. So I'll say this is maybe implication. Um, this is E experiments. Um, this is more of a proposals, proposals and proposals, right? So we just saw that in the abstract, we have uh, three proposal sentences and one experimental sentence, experimental result sentence and one implication sentence. So that was a one quick way to really analyze how the paper is structured. Okay, so let's go into the second paper, which is um, Herman et al. 2015. So I, I say this is task and method paper because um, it actually proposed a task and also method. So we'll actually see how that goes in the abstract. So let's read the abstract. Teaching machines to read natural language documents remains an elusive challenge. 
Machine reading systems can be tested on their ability to answer questions posed on the contents of documents that, that they have seen. But until now, large scale training and test data sets have been missing for this type of evaluation. In this work, we define a new methodology that resolves this bottleneck and provides large scale supervised reading comprehension data. This allows us to develop a class of attention based deep drill networks that learns to read and read real documents and answer complex questions with minimal prior knowledge of language structure. All right, so it's clear that they actually propose data and also deep neural network model. So that's why this is a task paper and also model paper. And you can see a lot of papers actually approach this way. They try to um, propose a new task and also new um, model, new method, which makes sense because um, when you're proposing, when you want to do a new problem, then you have to first actually define the problem. And also you will also talk about how your model differs and how, how you approach the problem, um, especially compared to uh, relatively very obvious ways. So this is why uh, I can think of this as a task plus method paper. And how about the each sentence in abstract? So um, the first sentence, teaching machines to read natural language, blah, blah, to elusive challenge. So this is exactly background, right? If you're talking about some very general statement of background and then um, or, or motivation. So maybe they are not super, um, distinct from each other. Machine reading systems can be tested on their ability to answer questions posed on the contents of documents that they have seen. But, so when you see but, then it usually you're trying to motivate something by saying something is problematic. So at least second sentence is a clearly a motivation. So this is, you're starting with some um, background and you're going into some motivation, right? And then you say in this work, we define a new methodology that resolved this bottleneck and provide large scale data. Um, so this is clearly proposal. And then uh, you're describing further about um, proposal, um, but you can also think of this as uh, also kind of implications, but I think it makes more sense to classify this into proposal. So in this case, you have background, motivation, and two proposal sentences. Good. All right. But we can do similar things on the introduction too. How about the uh, the third paper, Chen et al. So you haven't re read this paper previously. I mean, we haven't discussed this paper in this class, but let's take a look. So the title reads, A Thorough Examination of the CNN Daily Mail Reading Comprehension Task. It says, enabling a computer to understand a document so that it can answer comprehension question is a central yet unsolved goal of NLP. This is background, right? A key factor in impeding its solution by machine learned systems is the limited availab availability of human annotated data. This is also kind of background, right? Erman et al., which we just read, right? Uh, seek to solve this problem by creating over a million training examples by pairing CNN and Daily Mail news articles with their summarized bullet points and show that a neural network can then be trained to give good performance on this task. This is also kind of background. In this paper, we conduct a thorough examination of this new reading comprehension task. So this is what they're kind of doing. So it's kind of um, proposal, right? And our primary aim is to understand what depth of language understanding is required to do well on this task. They're talking about what they're doing too. We approach this from one side by doing a careful hand analysis of a small subset of the problems and from the others, other by showing the simple 
carefully designed systems can obtain accuracies of 73.6 and 76.6% on these two data sets, exceeding current state of the art results by seven to 10% and approaching what we believe is the ceiling for performance of this task. So it's a bit long sentence. So it kind of starts with some proposal and then it talks about some experimental results, right? And here, the last sentence is more of implications, right? What this means, what these results mean, it's kind of implication. So it start, it's one sentence that has proposal and what that results in and also implications. And now you see that why this is analysis paper and also kind of a model method paper because they actually analyze this data set in a really very closely, very, very closely, but they also actually propose a model, a simple model that can do pretty well. So it's kind of, um, I will say method plus analysis. So let's go into next paper. Uh, I have only four minutes, so I'll be a bit quick. So this is the original squad paper. So let's read the abstract. We present the Stanford question answering data set, a new reading comprehension data set consisting of 100,000 questions posed by crowd workers on a set of Wikipedia articles, where the answer to each question is a segment of text from the corresponding reading passage. It's proposal, right? And we analyze the data set to understand the types of reasoning required to answer the question, leaning heavily on dependency and constituency trees. So this is also kind of proposal what they're doing in the paper. Um, we build a strong logistic regression model, which achieves an F1 score of 51%, a significant improvement over a simple baseline. Uh, it's kind of proposal plus experimental results, right? However, human performance uh, is much higher, indicating that the data set presents a good challenge problem for future research. This is kind of implication, right? So that's like one way to really analyze the paper. So they basically um, actually, they also have a model here too, but I think I, I don't really say this is a model paper, method paper, because it really focused on task and the method is very uh, baseline. So it, that's why I'm saying it's subjective. Some people might say this is like plus method, but I think it's not really method. Let's go into last paper before we end our um, lecture today. So this is the popular paper, Transformer. So let, let's read the abstract again. Dominant sequence trans transduction models are based on complex recurrent or convolutional neural networks that include an encoder and a decoder. So this is background, right? The best performing models also connect the encoder and decoder through an attention mechanism. Also background. We propose a new simple uh, net uh, network architecture that trans. Um, so actually, the previous sentence can be either B or uh, motivation. They are kind of. Um, it also kind of motivates why we we don't we want to use attention. We propose a simple network architecture, the transformer, based solely on attention mechanism, dispensing with recurrence and convolutions entirely. It's clearly proposals, right? Um, Experiments on two machine translation tasks show these models to be superior in quality while being more paralyzable and requiring significantly less time to train. It's experiments, right? Our model achieved 28.4 um, blue on the WMT and um, German translation task, improving over the existing best results, including ensemble by over two blue score. It's also experiments. Uh, on the WMT 2014, um, our model established a new single model, state of the art, blah, 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 to um, AGPUs. Also, experiments. We show that uh, Transformer generalized well to other tasks by applying it successfully to English constituency parsing, both with large and limited training data. This is also kind of experiments, too. So, of course, um, um, the how I divide these um, each sentence is not um, I would say there is like I'm not saying there's only one way to do that, 
you might also want to come with your own categorization, but hopefully um, you get the point what, what I'm trying to say. And you see that um, the, when you have a really strong result, um, abstract is relatively um, talking about a lot about the experiments, right? Because um, you want to emphasize your experiments. But then uh, sometimes you talk a lot about the proposal when you're trying to, um, you know, also emphasize how your method is very novel and um, very different from the previous ex previous methods. So uh, you see like it's very, I mean, even if these five papers are all talking about NLP and kind of uh, in some sense, relatively sim similar things, how they structure the um, the abstract is quite different, right? So, um, but then one thing I wanted to say before today's lecture is um, actually, um, I have to actually go through this. Um, I'm a bit over the, um, I don't have much time, but um, I'll describe what you want to do on Wednesday. So um, on Wednesday, you got keys will lead discussions and uh, we have four TAs, so about 15 to 20 people in each session because we have about 70 people. And each TA will prepare four papers to discuss and four to five people get assigned to each paper. Um, so in first 20 minutes, you'll read the paper and prepare for the discussion. I only did this for abstract, but I'm, um, I'm gonna ask um, you to do this also for the introduction too, so that um, you can see how the arguments actually, how the paper proposes its argument, how they persuade the readers. And for the next 60 minutes, um, you will devote 15 minutes for each paper and you will discuss um, how the paper actually um, argues and how it differs from other papers, including the papers we discussed today. Um, so that will be your Wednesday schedule. So hopefully you will enjoy the discussions and hopefully this was a bit helpful on, on your future writing in your course of study. So thanks. And um, I'll see you on Wednesday, although I think T's will see you on Wednesday. I'll, you will come to this Zoom, but they will use the Zoom breakout to break into different um, sessions in the Zoom um, meeting. Thanks, everyone.